begin the conference with the first plenary session for the day, which is based on the theme, Smart and Scalable, Building Infrastructure for Growth. The eminent panelists for the session are Mr. Rajiv Kaul, Chairman, Nikko Corporation Limited, Mr. Paras Shahdat Puri, Chairman, Nikai Group of Companies, and Mr. Richard Reiki, Chief Executive Officer, KPMG in India. This, the session is being chaired by Mr. Rajiv Luthra, Founder and Managing Partner, Luthra and Luthra Law Offices. Mr. Rajiv K. Luthra is the founder and managing partner of Luthra and Luthra Law Offices, one of India's largest and most prestigious full-service corporate law firms. He has over three decades of experience as a trusted advisor to the Indian government, top domestic and international corporations, and serves on numerous corporate boards. Sorry. May I invite the panelists on stage and request Mr. Rajiv Luthra to kindly conduct the session. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for our panelists, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored to be here today with this extremely distinguished panel that is going to discuss what I believe is both topical and of utmost essence in today's time. With depleting natural resources on the one hand and rapidly multiplying population on the other, our governments are under constant pressure to provide for their people and striving for a mere survival is not what governance is all about. Therefore, I pose this very simple question, how do we grow? I know you'll all be looking at me, I've grown a lot, but so I should know. And more importantly, how do we grow efficiently and quantitatively? I'll give you a hint. Government alone cannot and should not take the task upon itself. I'm sure this esteemed panel has more than brilliant ideas on this, and I would like to start this session by sharing some of my thoughts and then leave the floor for my friends here. They'll have about 10 to 12 minutes each. That's the way we structured the panel, and then there'll be open house Q&A. First, industry and infrastructure have always been our sunshine sectors. They, they drive revenue and employment, and therefore automatically are perceived as the sweetheart of development and economic empowerment. Add to this a dash of combined public-private efforts, and you have a recipe of potential success. It is always heartening to see the two create together and trend to moving away from a mere growth-oriented approach, which generally tends to be a statistical or numbers game, and instead focus on development and empowerment, which are there by very nature more holistic and beneficial. This progressive government vision is the need of the hour. And that brings me to my second point about the smart way to achieve this, public-private partnerships and joint ventures and, of course, funding. The positive impacts of public and private partnerships uh, 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 sectors working together or of international conglomerates joining hands are fairly obvious. There is a strong case for creating such structures across the globe. In the case of PPPs, the efficiency and expertise of the private sector works in tandem with government ideologies and development and empowerment to generate growth that is both inclusive and sustainable. However, despite deep motivations from all over the continent, roadblocks exist at every stage. The usual suspects are domestic policy issues, opaque, unpredictable, and unstable tax, regulatory, and comp compliance regimes, etc. These are all issues that are being addressed by the government of India as we speak. Transparency, predictability, and stability coupled with bilateral trade and investment agreements among states will go a long way in concretizing mutual development and economic empowerment. But the crux of sustainability lies in something that is fundamental and essential to our very existence, our natural resources. So before we commence this complex discussion on sustainable growth, we must take a step back and think for a moment. What about regenerating our resources? There is, of course, no easy solution to this, but I thought I might share an interesting initiative that I'm very proud to be involved with, and we recently set this up. This is all about how do we empower our people. Now, we can have 
heavy hitting budgets and we can have heavy hitting theories of 1.2 billion people. No amount of money can bring that whole story out unless the people get involved. So we founded, uh, along with a few other friends, uh, one of them is Amir Khan, he's a famous actor, there is Mukesh Ambani, there is uh, Sachin Tendulkar, and a few other eminent people. Of course, I was mistaken for an eminence, but that aside. Uh, we, in, we set up a thing called a Pani Foundation. Water is a major scarce resource. Now what happens is that in place, le particularly like Maharashtra, and we are an agro country, and uh, our whole agriculture suffers because most places we get rain and most places we don't. And there's a lot of erraticity. So what we've done is we are going to choose five odd people. We've got world experts on water management in rural areas on board. We're going to choose five people from 20 villages to begin with. And we will train these five people and then send them back to the village to go and do water management and, and uh, water harvesting and in a local basis. And that hopefully will build up into a full movement and the people will see their hero and heroines who have bought water to their village and really built it up. And that's the whole idea. Of course, we are putting some money power in it as well. Out of these 20 villages, we are going to have an initial contest where the first two villages who do well will get a, a, a crore of rupees, which is about a little over $120,000, $130,000 as a, a corpus to build and disseminate more information and build this whole initiative. <clears throat> I hope that some days not too far away from the future, we look at the larger picture of collaboration, knowledge sharing and collective initiatives and witness a rising Asia jointly and all her territories individually. Only then will we justifiably have realigned our destiny and be capable of leading sustainability as a singular global community. Now, before I introduce the speakers, uh, the organizers sent me detailed biodata, which are extremely impressive, and most of you would know them um, uh, and their achievements. I just thought I'd delve a little bit deeper into their lives to see what are they all about and, and talk about it. I hope my unorthodox ways uh, helps with the proper introduction. First up, we have Rajiv Kaur. We just talked about a little while back. He's my namesake with an E. He's the chairman of NICO Group, the Honorary Council General of the Republic of Korea. One among the many that NICO is involved in is their work on amusement parks. I read something interesting the other day. Mr. Kaur traveled all the way to Disneyland to study it, lead it up to creating NICO Park in Kolkata. I was speaking of PPPs just a few minutes back. The Nico Park, as we know, is a great example of how things turn out when the government and private sector work together. Mr. Call, of course, has been associated with various industry bodies and serves on the board of a multitude of educational institutions. He graduated from Imperial College London and continues to be associated with Salma Mehta, Alumni, and international bodies. His commitment to philanthropy is evidenced by the fact that he supports organizations that help in providing free medical aid and medicines to about 50,000 patients every year. It is my proud privilege to welcome you, uh, Rajiv, to this discussion. <laughs> Next, we have with us today Mr. Paras Shadadpuri, an eminent diplomat turned a successful entrepreneur. Mr. Sadat Puri is an ambassador of Indian business in this region. No pun intended, sir. His tale is simply inspirational. Mr. Sadat Puri's final diplomatic uh, stint was in Libya, post which he decided to embark upon a new journey. He started his career in business, not knowing what a sales or a marketing manager does, not knowing what a CFO stands for. He's spot on when he says he had to invent the wheel at every stage. That was then, and this is now. Mr. Shadad Puri is the chairman of the Nikai Group of Companies, is affiliated with various industry associations, and is internationally known as Mr. Reliable. He was awarded the prestigious Bharat Shiromani Award in the year 2005 in his recognitions of his contributions and achievements as a prominent non-resident Indian. I'm delighted to welcome you as well, sir. And then finally, last but not the least, is the man, Mr. Richard Rickey. 
He's the CEO of KPMG India, one of the world's largest business consulting groups. Recently, unanimously re-elected to head the group for another four years. I must say that I tried to find a lot of dirt on him. I couldn't find anything. The only thing I found on him, and I talked to a bunch of his colleagues, former and current, who I know quite well, each and every one, almost unanimously, I think he's coached them or something, they just said he's a true leader, I'll read the words they said, angelic boss, uh, available 24-7, speaks from the heart. I mean, I also run an organization, much, much smaller than his, but I am called the dictator in my firm. Nobody's ever called me an angelic boss. I need to talk to you about that, Richard, and give us some training aside. Of course, he has one minor vice. I call it a good thing. He drinks only red wine. Through his involvement with many industry bodies globally, Mr. Riki helps the Indian companies and governments to become more efficient and effective. In fact, the Make in India campaign of, in, uh, of our country, if Richard is not the backbone, he's certainly a whole lot of the vertebrates, that's for sure. And he's been helping the government to build this. Welcome, my friend. And once... And he's known also, just a little bit more on him, he's also known as an eloquent orator, etc. But he articulately once said, the genesis of all innovation, invention, efficiency, improvements is inspiration. I'm certain that this house is exactly that, is looking for that inspiration from my eminent panel today. And without taking any more of your time, I invite Mr. Rajiv Kohl to come and address us. Mr. Chairman, Rajiv Luthra, Founder and Managing Director, Luthra and Luthra Law Offices, uh, Mr. Paras Shadapuri, Chairman, Nikai Group of Companies, uh, my friend Richard Rekis, CEO, KPMG India, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to participate in this IMA India Conference in Dubai, and it is a special privilege for me to address this very august audience. As a past president of IMA, I am delighted that IMA is reaching out to the management fraternity of the UAE. This conference is another important step towards integrating Indian management with the international management ecosystem. It is appropriate that the main theme of this conference is developing human talent as one of the key mandates of IMA has been to prepare and upgrade management talent. Infrastructure is one sector that needs high quality of human capital in addition to a large quantity of financial capital. The days of dumb infrastructure are gone as it cannot meet the demand of today's knowledge economy, which is driven by constant connectivity and high-speed activity. The economy of today and that of the future needs infrastructure that is smart, and such an infrastructure requires not only metal and concrete, but also intelligent people and intelligent machines. Equally important is the need to build a smart infrastructure that is scalable. In the past, Infrastructure typically has been built to catch up with the growth in economic activity. There is now a need to build infrastructure that not only meets today's requirement, but can be tweaked to handle increased and challenging economic activities. In India, it can also be found that inadequacy of infrastructure costs our country nearly 2% in terms of GDP every year. If India can build infrastructure to create demand instead of just catching up, our country's GDP can grow at a double-digit growth rate and be a true engine of growth for the entire world. India has set out to invest big in infrastructure, including in smart infrastructure, particularly in our cities. Our government recently selected 20 cities to be developed 
as smart cities, which will serve as the models for creating urban infrastructure in the rest of the country. This will be followed by another 80 such cities. The key features of these smart cities would be efficient urban mobility, IT connectivity, digital administration, in addition to tech-enabled adequacy of power, water, and waste management. The development of smart infrastructure in these 20 cities will not only improve their efficiency and productivity, it will have a multiplier effect on the economies by attracting more investments, commerce, and talent to these cities. These cities are expected to compete with each other for domestic investment in talent, as also with other cities of the world for global investment in talent. The Smart Cities Project has attracted substantial interest, including private and public sector organizations from the USA, Germany, France, Japan, Malaysia, and indeed the UAE itself. While the Smart Cities Project will create exemplary infrastructure, India is also looking to invest more than 30 trillion US dollars in roads, railways, aviation, waterways, power, and ports. <coughs> India needs smart and scalable infrastructure in these areas in order to realize its Make in India mission. The slowness and unpredictability of movement of people and goods has been the bane of Indian manufacturing, particularly for global markets. This has made tremendous progress in highway building during the past decade and many tolled expressways improving connectivity between the cities has been a big help in this regard. While our country continues to press for further increase in roads and highway speeds, it is now focusing on making our railways competitive. Indian Railways has the fourth largest track network in the world and indeed the largest workforce. However, there is a vast scope for increasing in its efficiency. So far, it has largely focused on quantity of service and notes not so much on the quality of service. However, that is rapidly changing and the railways are now investing in technology and training. The proposed bullet train project with Japanese assistance has made headlines, but much bigger action is taking place in upgrading the tracks, stations, signaling, communication, energy efficiency, energy efficiency and diversification, <coughs> as also digitization of passenger and freight services. A smart Indian railways will be a key part of India's infrastructure modernization efforts. Furthermore, the proposed dedicated freight corridors in every zone of the country will not only help the manufacturing and export enterprises, but will also catalyze development of smart industrial townships along their routes. Ladies and gentlemen, our government has taken many initiatives to develop infrastructure and make it easier for private and foreign investors to undertake infrastructure projects. It has cleared the way for implementation of many projects that were stuck due to various administrative and political reasons. It is helping private investors by giving more time and funds to complete the projects and by extending the concession periods to improve viability of projects. It has passed laws to enable formalization and modernization of waterways and awarded about 100 new highway projects in the public-private partnership mode. It has also increased its own infrastructure investment, particularly in roads and railways. India's Prime Minister has traveled around the world soliciting investment in India, particularly in our infrastructure. While there is a clear movement in India towards infrastructure development, to make it scalable and sustainable requires sound management strategies and practices. For example, the experience of developing smart cities around the world shows that smartness of urban infrastructure has to be driven by people needs 
and not the cleverness of technology alone. Smart infrastructure also adds to the list of items that need to be built and management and managed for efficiency and scalability, primarily the data centers. As we build networks of connected infrastructure which communicate with each other and with users, there is going to be a need for huge data processing and communicating infrastructure. As data will only increase and accumulate, and e-commerce and e-governance will require that data be mined and shared, thus countries need to invest in data centers and as communication hubs. The connected countries will be the new winners in the competition for global business. It is clear that governments of both the UAE and India are on the ball today and they have started promoting smart infrastructure. Importantly, they are supporting the technological transition by promoting the development of human capital. There is ample scope for collaboration between <coughs> India and the UAE as both the government and the enterprise level and, in, and, the, and the enterprise level in this area and I am confident that this symposium will go a long way in building these partnerships. Thank you. Respected Chair, Mr. Luthra, distinguished panelists on the dais, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a very good and pleasant morning. I'm glad to see a large number of friends who have made it convenient to attend this morning session, which for me is an early morning. Before I go ahead with my remarks, I can't resist but to briefly speak about the historic India-UAE relationship which dates back to many centuries and is based on family-to-family -family contacts where people used to visit India not only for trade, but for medical, education, tourism, etc. There are a number of instances of marriages between Emirati and Indian nationals. A number of Emiratis have lived, studied, worked, died, and even buried there. Thus, this relationship has a unique emotional and sentimental quotient which has now flourished to trade and investments to, to a level that UAE and India are the third largest trading partners to each other without the oil trade. After three decades gap, Indian Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi made a landmark visit to UAE in August 2015, which, has, which was reciprocated last month by the visit of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi and Deputy Supreme Commander of UAE Armed Forces, who was accompanied by many cabinet ministers, senior officials, and top businessmen. And I had the privilege of visiting India with His Highness as a part of the UAE delegation. The warmth and connectivity and the proximity which I witnessed was unprecedented as if two lost brothers have met after many decades. Meanwhile, there has been an exchange of several ministers, and in fact, His Excellency Sheikh Nahyan, who is the chief guest, has returned from India only two days ago after attending a spectacular cultural festival in New Delhi. This loudly exhibits the urgency in the commitment of the two countries to raise this historic, robust relationship to the next strategic level, looking much beyond trade and economic times, ties. With this backdrop, this conference assumes special importance in furthering the cooperate, cooperation between the two countries, particularly in the field of infrastructure, which is the topic of this session. Friends, there is no doubt that infrastructure is the very key driver in any country's economic growth. 
Till two years ago, India has been stagnating at only 4% of GDP growth, primarily due to lack of infrastructure development, which fortunately stands now at 7%, and this is commendable in the context of current depressed global economic conditions. It is estimated that India requires more than one trillion US dollars in the next four to five years if it has to achieve and sustain an annual growth rate of eight to nine percent, flirting with the double digit. To mobilize this humongous amount is a Herculean task. India also must ensure that the infrastructure is smart and scalable. This is obvious that the government alone cannot generate such a large amount, particularly when it has promised to keep its fiscal deficit to below 4% of the GDP. Therefore, it is imperative that India encourages private sector participation, creates congenial environment to attract FDI, ensures the magic forward ease of doing business environment, etc. It is estimated that private sector should be able to generate half of this amount of 500 billion US dollars through debt financing and equity participation, and other half can be generated by the government so that the public-private partnership could be successfully created. It is heartening to note that the Prime Minister, of, uh, Prime Minister Modi's various initiatives, such as Make in India, Etc. have where FDI limits have been raised, automatic approval channels have been created for sectors like defense, roads, ports, railways, power, etc. It is hoped that the government walks the talk and its intentions are put into action in order to further establish the credibility and reliability of the present government. Thus, the opportunities for investment through domestic equity, FDI are abound for direct and PPP modes. Now some figures. Of the 75,000 kilometers of total length of road network, only 17% is national highway network with four lane standards, while 53% being two lane and the remaining single lane highways. The railway infrastructure is obsolete and needs major upgradation. Currently, the freight cargo travels at an average speed of 22 kilometers per hour, while the passenger trains average at 50 kilometers. India has a huge coastline of 7,500 kilometers, but with only 12 major ports, which are grossly inadequate to handle almost 1 billion metric tons of cargo. 90% of countries' trade in volume is moved through maritime transport. The Indian aviation market is expected to become the third largest across the globe by 2020. The sector is projected to handle more than 300 million domestic passengers and 85 million international passengers with projected investment of $120 billion. As a major step, in this direction, the government of India has unveiled plans to invest US dollars 137 billion in rail network over the next five years. Additionally, it has announced highway projects of US dollars 93 billion, which includes the flagship NHDP's National Highway Development Projects. So in this scenario, we have to see what India needs to do First, ease of doing business and simplification of procedures and processes are of utmost importance. The PPP model would need to be tweaked. So far, the PPP models have been on BOT, built, operate, and transfer basis by entrepreneurs to the government. But an innovative mode, this role should be reversed and the government should take on the investment and project building while the private sector focuses on the operational phase. While on this subject, the government may consider divesting 
in many current state-owned projects and hand over to private enterprises, thus unlocking huge funds, which in turn can be invested in new infrastructure projects to be built by the government. This will be an innovative step in economic and commercial terms. Government would have to initiate actions to remove a gamut of obstacles from land disputes to sheer bureaucracy, red tape to environment clearances, etc. India would have to create a strong, strong institution which are credible and predictable, particularly when it comes to taxation. The government is making business easy by delicensing and deregulation. It has made the process of applying for industrial license online through eBiz, a G to B, a government to business service portal, thus eliminating the visits of the entrepreneurs to various government departments. The present government has already taken determined steps to settle disputes on previously stuck, half completed projects and revitalizing them by giving them adequate concessions which will help complete the stalled project, particularly in the road sector. In fact, India needs a mix of such big bang reforms along with steady and consistent reforms. Having said what the government should do, however, it will not be correct for the investors to have unrealistic expectations. Though a single party government ensures stability, it alone by no means guarantees action. There is a political will available, but in terms of putting various measures into action, support from the state governments, many of which are governed by opposition parties, is required. Thus, there are factors that are working as attractors, detractors, and facilitators for India, which would need to be evaluated by the investors. Along with the major initiatives such as Make in India, Skill India, Digital India, Swaj Bharat, which means clean government, uh, clean India, etc., I see an innovative initiative of the Modi government of building 100 smart cities all over the country. Currently, 31% of India's population lives in cities, generating 53% of the nation's economy. This would rapidly increase to almost half of Indian population living in cities by 2030. To take the pressure away from the mega metros, building of smart cities is a smart move and will provide quality of life to the residents and in future also. This is a bold initiative by the government which will drive economic growth by harnessing technology and high-tech communication to en enhance performance, to reduce costs and resources consumption. These smart cities typically use IT to anticipate and address urban problems with the cohesive approach to achieve sustainable urban development. I see tremendous opportunities available both in UAE and India to synergize their strengths to build smart and scalable infrastructure which can sustain the urban population explosion in the decades to come. UAE is a leader in innovation and cities like Dubai, which are not endowed with natural resources, are ranked in the topmost cities of the world. UAE's state-of-the-art smart and sustainable infrastructure has given boost to logistics, tourism, financial, health, trade, and manufacturing sectors. UAE has indicated its commitment to investing as much as 75 billion US dollars in India over the next few years, primarily in its infrastructure. And given its experience in innovation and clean energy, I'm sure it can add value to India's infrastructure and economic growth. Similarly, I have no doubt that given India's prowess in technology, in solar, wind, and atomic energy, and its various soft skills and human dividend, all this can be harnessed by UAE for its future sustainable development. 
Friends, here I would like to put in a word on the potential of non-resident Indians in India's infrastructure development. There are about 30 million NRIs and persons of Indian origin worldwide with lots of investable surplus. Imagine if only an amount of 10,000 US dollars per capita is contributed. We have a humongous amount of 300 billion US dollars. But I say, if only per capita investment of $1,000 is garnered annually, we have 30 billion US dollars available to India from this patriotic diaspora. I must say that government should tap this enormous resource which is lying within its reach. Friends, world is looking east and India is the prime destination for the next three decades. I also see a very, very bright future, a smart, scalable and sustainable future for the cooperation between India and UAE. And what we need is to take the first step forward. Well, Modi government has done it. Now it is the turn of our friends to step forward. Inshallah, it will bring rich dividends to all these stakeholders. God bless us all the way and we pray for the prosperity of India and UAE in this joint partnership. Amin. Thank you. Thank you, Paris. Uh, that is quite insightful. We'll ask you a few questions and some of your thoughts later. Richard, the angelic boss. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Rajiv Luthra, dignitaries on the stage, uh, dignitaries in the audience, I can see so many of them. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning from my side. And uh, I would like to thank Aima for, first of all, organizing such a conference and giving me an opportunity to come and speak at this conference. I think the topic, uh, this topic is also very relevant because infrastructure is not a challenge. Uh, infrastructure is not a challenge only for India or the developing world. It's a challenge for every single country in the world. <clears throat> Everybody lags in infrastructure. Just to give you some statistics, the world needs about $57 trillion of investment in infrastructure over the next 18 years, which means about three point some trillion dollars per year. And if you look at all the infrastructure assets on the ground today, that is, it's more than the total infrastructure assets on the ground today. And if you look at what investments took place in the last 18 years, is 60% more than that. So the kind of scale we are talking about is unheard of, un, uh, and it has never been experienced before. Now, uh, now put this on. Uh, put the new, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, which all of you may have heard about, where the Internet of Things is overtaking everybody's life, and where technology is becoming the greatest disruptor, and how that is going to change the world, how that is going to change the various issues facing the world, because we need to understand that. Uh, when the fourth industrial revolution, which in my view, we are already in it. It's not going to come. It's not something that is going to come. It, we are already in it at the moment. It is going to uh, change the way uh, production happens. It's going to change the way distribution happens. It's going to change the way consumption happens. The entire scale and force of that is going to completely change from the way we are used to currently. And that is something that we need to be ready because it's going to impact food security, it's going to impact water security. It's going to impact job security. So, you know, we keep talking, at least in India, we have this big challenge. We have got 15 million people who have to be put into jobs. And if the fourth industrial revolution is sitting on our head, where do you actually find? So I think it is time that government, civil society, business, and everybody who, academia, everybody who matters comes together because this is an enormous problem uh, facing the world and we need to understand it. And then if we look at uh, what's happening on the global side, climate change is becoming a big factor. Cli uh, uh, when a global risk landscape was done recently for 2016, climate change came as the number one risk factor. Of course, the most immediate was geopolitical risk. I mean, this is a big thing that is happening where the geopolitical, uh, and I'll just come to it, how that is actually going to impact uh, the way we uh, look at things. But, uh, it is estimated, it is estimated 
that this climate change, if not tackled properly, will impact the Africa nation, the entire Africa nation, by 3% GDP. India will have about 3% GDP again if it is not tackled uh, properly. So I think we need to understand. And also it has a v another effect. If global warming takes place, it also impacts agriculture. There'll be water scarcity. And then there will be other issues around uh, health uh, because people are not used to that kind of warm climate that will actually come in, which will have its own. It's good for the medical industry on, on one side, but it has its own challenges out here. We already heard about the smart city, so I'm not going to talk about it. I think there are some major infrastructure projects on the anvil. One is the two, gray, uh, two grand trade routes. One is the India, uh, India North, uh, no, International North-South Transport Corridor, and the One Belt, One Road of China, which is called the China to Europe Silk Road. These are two very, very ambitious projects, because if the first one comes through, the INSTC, it will help a goods to move from the Mumbai port to Europe in half the time, and the cost will be, uh, you know, the cost of freight or moving 15 tons of cargo will come down by $2,500. So the, this is the impact that some of these uh, changes are going to have. And the China to Europe Silk Road is, is possibly the most ambitious project because where China wants to build out the new Silk Route across that place. And the other one is the Great Asian Highway projects. Nine of them are planned. Six of them run through India. So these are uh, going to have its own impact because um, uh, in the 60s when US was building out the roads, the American president was asked, why are you wasting so much money building out these roads? He's saying, I'm building roads so that they will make money for the economy. And that's what actually America witnessed. And if we get our logistics right, if we get our roadways and rail both right, I think we will uh, go a long way. I think the other important thing on infrastructure is uh, the, what the government and private sector need to work. How do we reduce the demand on infrastructure? And that could be by going for some energy saving devices. You know, how can, will solar actually overtake? Will solar become the new uh, power? Um, I was seeing a World Economic Forum report which said that over the next 30 years, there will be more solar plants put up than thermal. And if that's the way to go, so one would see that. Then the streamlining of delivery. We have to see our permissions. I think the cost, we heard earlier speakers talk that the cost of uh, delayed permissions is actually costing the GDP a lot of money. And I think we need to work of how to make it. And one example is the new South Wales state in Australia, which actually changed in one year the approval time by 11%. And they saw the benefits of it. And of course, the last but not the least, how do we optimize existing infrastructure assets? How do we optimize existing infrastructure assets that we already have? And actually, this uh, fourth industrial revolution I was talking about, the Internet of Things, is going to help that. It's going to say that how do we make use of the current infrastructure? One example I can give is in United Kingdom, where um, uh, they reduced the 25% of travel time on this M42 and 50% in accidents by just um, intelligent transportation system. We heard about smart cities. We heard about IT creating all of this. So this, this will itself create that. Now, there are some trends which are actually impacting the, you know, as we go, infrastructure doesn't happen today. It doesn't happen tomorrow. It, it's long term. And I think we need to look at what are those trends. I think the first thing that I would like to put across that there is no normal now. The point we kept saying there's a new normal, there's a normal, now there is no normal because what is happening now, the geopolitical risks that are happening are putting everything into jeopardy. What people would plan or what they would, they do know which country is having issues with which country. So I think people need to understand and re-look at how they're going to put their put capital because you know risk and capital go together. They will have to see how to evaluate that risk and see what comfort level they will get. And that's why I believe that countries like India and China are going to take center stage. Because if your risk appetite is higher, you will go and take those risks and go ahead and do it and also get the benefits from there. Of course, competition is going to heat up. And as competition heats up, uh, one would see that the person who again takes that risk is going to be at the front. Asset management is getting more sophisticated because of, again, the Internet of Things how the same machine can be used more effectively and by more people and earn more money. That is what is going to uh, change where the current assets on the ground, how they can uh, um, 
be used more effectively. Of course, one very big thing which people have realized, but I don't know whether the realization is fully dawned on everybody, is the security risk. The security risk that comes with the Internet of Things, the cyber security threat, uh, which the political unrest, uh, these are going to be, because you don't need an army today to wage a war. You can bring down an entire system through cyber attack. And you can, you know, we are so much linked today with cyber in the cyber world. And today, everything we are moving off into that cyber world. I think the security of cyber attack is so real. Warfares will be fought in the cyber world and not on land. There won't be now. You don't need armies. Cyber attack is good enough to uh, get there. We will have to find new innovative ways of uh, uh, infrastructure funding. We will need to find, uh, and uh, so innovative, because today the current, like I told you the enormity of the problem, the amount of money that is required. I don't think that money is available. So one will have to find out how do you find innovative ways. The institutional debt market will need to take off. They'll have to become more liquid than what it is today. And that would require the multilateral agencies to play a much larger role of, uh, than what they are playing currently. So I think this is going to be something which is going to be uh, very important. Like I said, China and India have both arrived on the global stage. They can successfully compete with their Western counterparts in being able to come up with innovative ways of actually delivering the infrastructure projects. The companies are more. Now, what is India doing? India, I think, has done uh, a few things. We have heard from the earlier speakers. I will not repeat them. But we have opened up our railways, which is our big rail network, uh, to allow infrastructure funding, 100% infrastructure funding into railways. And once we get our railways right, uh, I mean the transportation, which is the biggest problem in India, logistics costs, possibly one of the most expensive in the world, I think we'll see a great. Uh, the other one which is there, which is very recently been spoken about, is port-led growth. I mean, just giving you one example, around the Andhra coast, we've got 1,000 kilometers of port, which will actually connect India to the east. And that will create a gateway of movement and make the movement of goods. So you, you create these, uh, these uh, port-led cities, which China actually uh, was, uh, uh, has proved earlier. So India has this big thing of creating these zones, coastal economic zones, where you can create manufacturing, you can create export, import, everything at the port, and then you create hinterland, uh, either inland waterways, or you create a rail network to connect it to the rest of the country. I think that is something that one is going to see. Airports, we have seen a push in this budget also on the airports of how do you create more airports, MROs in India, which will reduce a lot of the foreign exchange which is there. So I think we're going to see a lot of activity. We need more Indians to fly. And you need more planes. It should become like a taxi service. So I think uh, maybe this is the harbinger or starting of that. And India also needs to become a destination where it becomes a hub for international travelers. And I think that's one thing which one uh, would like to see also. Roads and highways, it's already been opened up. We're seeing a lot of expenditure out there. And if you look at uh, the expansion of highways, rural and urban, both we are seeing uh, things move out there. Now, if we have to look at some of the roadmap to enhance infrastructure, here are a few points I would like to leave behind. One is change the land availability norms and tighten the contractual penalties. India has a huge problem on contractual penalties, and I think that needs to get tightened. Establish a high power group to de-bottleneck all the old projects. There are a huge amount of projects. There are different numbers floating around. So I don't want to quote a number, because everybody comes with a different estimate, but it's in billions of dollars, that's all I can say, which are stuck. They need to be de-bottled. Because any investor you want to come in, they'll say, OK, first clear my old project, then let's talk of uh, new investments. And then we need to see how we can increase. We heard Rajiv call successful PPP projects. There are a number of PPP projects that are successful. But what we always talk about are the ones which are not successful. So we need to take these success models and take it to the country and see what worked there. Can we not replicate the model and make more successful PPP uh, projects? And also, when we select our design and engineering consultants, let's move away from the L1, which the government normally uses move to the best in class so that you get the best advice that is possible. I think that would be. And then we should, um, uh, we should also see how we can make, uh, you, know, uh, you know, when you start a project, sometimes these projects are very long. The world changes. 
The government should be flexible enough to understand when the world is changed, norms will have to change. You can't go and say, okay, I approved that at that time. Those are the reality. Reality changes, and with change in reality, we need to look at it. I would like to leave a few questions, Chairman, with your permission, to the floor of the House to debate as the questions come up. The first question I have to this August audience is, will solar power become the world's biggest source of energy before 2025? That's the first question. Second, will robots take over infrastructure operations? How will the aging population influence infrastructure needs? Because even while India is seeing young population, you look at the number of people who are in the age category, it's huge when, it look, when you really look at the numbers. Will physical commuting become a thing of the past with Internet of Things taking over? And will the completion of the Panama Canal transform global trade? Thank you very much.